So the discrepancy between what was expected and observed is due to two factors. Uh, one, which okay, was pointed out by Francis Rokeshaw, is that, well, while it's true that the, you have an average spacing, what you're seeing as uh, producing the transitions are the atoms that are closer to that. So if you take into account the fact that you have a whole, at any density you have a whole range of spacings, that counts for some reasonable fraction of the width. But it's also true, as I showed you in the previous picture, um, an atom may have a nearest neighbor, but its next nearest neighbor is not miles away. It's comparably far away. And so you have to take that into account. And in this <coughs> cesium problem that we considered, we, we started out with two atoms in the 23, two atoms in the 23 p state, and so we we, both, we always have a whole sea of these 23 atoms, and so if we actually have two 23 p's going to 23 s and 24 s, one of these say this 24 s atom finds itself in the sea of these 23 p atoms, and so. This dipole-dipole exchange is always resonant. It doesn't matter whether there's a field present or not, it's there. So that actually leads to some of the problem. And so it's not just one interaction that you have to take into account in these problems. Okay. Okay. So I would like to now look at this in two pieces. So first of all, I'd like to make the connection to the binary collision <coughs> that we were discussing earlier. So in the collision problem, we, at time t, t equals zero, we excited the S state for it. And then on resonance, the, you know, the two eigenstates, the plus and minus combinations, split apart in energy and then they recombine. So as the, as the two atoms come together, the levels separate. And as they move apart, they come back together again. And if you have a phase accumulation of pi, you have a transition. Okay, in the frozen Rydberg gas, <coughs> Basically, everything is fixed at, say, at some radius. Two atoms are some distance apart. So they're just sitting here. Nothing is moving on this picture. You're just sitting. So instead of thinking of, of this graph as time, it's a graph of the energy levels as a function of displacement. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so since I already had the slides from this problem, which is identical to the cesium one, uh, well, once again, our slides are wise now. <coughs> So our initial state is SS is this, and our final state is this, and these are the two eigenstates, which are valid at any spacing between the atoms. So what we make with our laser, which is of course a pulse laser that has a coherent bandwidth of 100 plus megahertz, is we make the coherent superposition of these two eigenstates which initially corresponds to SS. Right? The laser, is a, we excite atoms from the 5P state of rubidium. <coughs> and what we make is this, which is a coherent superposition of this state plus this one. Okay. And <coughs> so then, in time, of course, this coherent superposition just beats. It's, it is a quantum beat experiment. It, it's like a quantum beat experiment. And if, <coughs> in fact, we have all the atoms <coughs> spaced equally apart, we should in fact be able to see the population oscillate back and forth between this SS and PP state. Okay, well, but we don't have such well-trained atoms. And so actually, if you look at the probability of making transitions to the P state, it's saturated. <coughs> so, so basically, the same picture that we use to describe the collisions can also be used to describe the sort of the, the binary effects in the cold river gas. So let's go back to the main body aspects of this. So <clears throat> it turns out that in rubidium, in the, the D states, the D3 half states, are almost degenerate with uh, this PF combination, up to Ns for P and down to F. And <clears throat> of course, this particular N combination is effectively resonant with zero field. Well, that is, the detuning is about eight, <coughs> seven or eight megahertz, and if you have a big dipole-dipole interaction, it's effectively resonant. So, <coughs> in fact, when they populate at the Michigan and the group of Gator and Rachel, when they populate this 43D state and do the field ionization signal, look at the field ionization signal, 
They see something very different than populating, say, 45S, which is energetic in your body, or 43D. Okay. <coughs> here in 45S, they basically see this sharp peak here. In 40, <coughs> from 43D, 5S, they see something earlier right here, which in fact corresponds to the field ionization of the 45P state. So, of course, you would expect that you would see something like this because of the dipole dipole effect. However, uh, you can't explain how big this is by just taking into account pairs of atoms. You have to take into account more than just the nearest neighbor. Okay. Now, there, there have been multiple experiments to actually probe whether or not how or whether or not these many atom effects actually exist. And the two previous experiments are in fact claims that that's what it is, but they didn't prove it. <coughs> so Mike Noel and his collaborators at Bryn Mawr <coughs> studied this process, which is <coughs> tuned into resonance, by <coughs> in fact changing the geometry of the sample. Okay. So by focusing a laser beam through a lot. So if you in fact <coughs> make the, the sample of atoms that you've created a long skinny cylinder, Essentially, you have atoms almost in a line. So here you have essentially binary interactions. I mean, this can only interact with this one. Or, I mean, you don't have a three-dimensional sample. On the other hand, <coughs> if you expand the beam from, say, <coughs> 5 microns up to 20 microns, you now have a sample which is clearly three-dimensional. You have atoms everywhere. And in fact, you can explore what effects the geometry has on this process occurring. Okay. So <coughs> the, the red curve is, <coughs> is what, what they observe with the, 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 <coughs> the skinny cylinder. In all cases, notice it's the same number of Rydberg atoms. Okay? <coughs> so this is a 5 micron diameter cylinder, sorry, radius cylinder. And this is a 20 micron radius cylinder. They actually see more interaction strength in the 20, <coughs> 19 micron radius sample. Okay. So it's four times as big in radius to diameter. That means it's 16 times, it, it has 1 16th the density. So in spite of the fact that this has a much lower density, they clearly see more interaction. So it's obvious that, well, it seems to me that this is telling you that it's not, the binary interactions are not all Okay, so another way of doing this was, was done in rubidium. So in rubidium, the, the frozen gas experiment, like the cesium one, started with atoms in this 33S and 25S state, this would be around 24 P, 34. This goes not from 33S to 33P, but to 34P. That's kind of important. Okay, so in principle, these these always resonant interactions are, play some role in the winds. Uh, at least that's, that's, that was the claim. So if that's true, <coughs> then if I added atoms, <coughs> put atoms in this 34S state, that has a huge dipole-dipole interaction. These are the size of the dipole matrix elements. Th this has a huge dipole-dipole interaction with the 34P state, but it has nothing to do with the tuning that lets you see this resonance in the first place. So if I add these, if these always resonant effects are important, it should show up. So <coughs> if you <coughs> populate the 20, <coughs> 25S and 33S and don't add any 34S atoms, the population you see in 34P looks like this. And if you transfer 20% of the 33S atoms to 34S, okay, it clearly gets wider. In spite of the fact that you've actually lowered the depth, I mean, it gets wider and taller, in spite of the fact that you have less 33S atoms. And this is just a higher density. So it seems pretty clear that this actually makes a difference. So you can see, hmm, there, there, that, okay, so that's supposed to be infinity. It's pretty interesting how this translates things. Okay, anyway, so you can begin to see why <coughs> Why does having that make a difference? And you can see that from a three atom picture. So I have two states. The initial state is 25S, 33S, and 33S or 34S. And the final state is 
24p, 34p, and then either 1, 33s, or 34s. This, this one's just a spectator. So <clears throat> this is at oracle infinity they cross. Uh, at any finite spacing, actually there, there are now two dipole-dipole interactions. If you have the always resonant, if, if <clears throat> the third atom is in 34s, sorry, 33s, the 33s, 34p dipole-dipole interaction is quite weak. And so there, that's an always resonant interaction that slightly splits these two levels, which you can hardly see. And so as you scan through the resonance, you basically see these two. Uh, this is what the levels look like, and the transition probability is like this. On the other hand, if <coughs> the third atom is 34s, that has a big interaction with 34p. So the final state has, always has this big splitting shown right here due to the 34s, 34p interaction. And now that the level crossings look like this, <coughs> you actually compute the transition probability and they look like this. Okay, so it's clearly broader. And if you then average over, of course, the random spacings, you wind up, in fact, finding a line that's both taller and broader. Okay. Now, <coughs> uh, the, the final actually, <coughs> demonstration that more than, more than two atoms can interact with each other was recently done in <coughs> Peter PA's group. And it's based on the same CCM transition that I showed you earlier. So earlier I showed you the case of two 23p atoms, kind of 23s and 24s, at 79.94 volts per centimeter. And if you have two 24s atoms, they in fact can make a 23p one half and 23d at 80 volts per centimeter. And <coughs> between these two, Actually, you could have four of these 23p one-half atoms <coughs> making two 23s, one 23p, and one 23d. This state is the highest lying state among these, and so it actually has a well-resolved field ionization. <coughs> so these are the energy levels of these states. This is 4p states. And here's where it crosses a pair of s and s prime. This is sort of this twice. Or this is what happens if you leave two of them in 2p. The resonance is always here. This is this resonance. Uh, <coughs> this resonance is out here. And this is the resonance for this upper <coughs> four-body interaction. And in fact, if you look at the data, this is the two-body one that they saw you know, 15 years ago. Uh, this is the two-body one in which you make two 23s atoms, and one goes up to d, and one goes down to p half. And this is the four-body one. Uh, I, okay. Let me remind you that while this looks perilously close to this one, uh, the signature of this is the field ionization of 23D, which is substantially different from the field ionization of 24S observed here. So the fact that it's at a, it overlaps it in field doesn't actually matter. Okay. So it's clear that they can see four atoms interacting at once. Okay. So <clears throat> with these cold atoms, you can actually do several other interesting things. Everything I've described so far is basically a soup of all the atoms in the same place. I have no way of, I, I, I can't control their spacing or anything else. And one of the first adventures in this direction was done at the Foam Institute, <coughs> in which <coughs> all right, Ben, Ben Linden, Ben Ben Hoyle, Barton Gordon, Francis Robichaud and Carolyn von Dietzusen. And I don't know if I'm, anyway, so they in fact had a mod and they focused two beams into it to excite atoms to either the 41D state where they put about 70 of them or the 49S state in which they put maybe 10 to 15 atoms. And they in fact looked for the resonant transfer in which the 41D went down and the 49S went up. Okay. And so the idea is that you can, in fact, now have well spatially separated samples of atoms, and by just displacing the laser beams, they can move these apart. Okay. So, <coughs> in fact, uh, the, this is a position of the excited atoms because of the beams. You can see you can move them right through each other, and, and in fact, you can see this is, in fact, the size of the resonant transfer signal as a function of position. Uh, so we calculate the solid lines here and make up these things. There's a hole in the center basically because the, the high D population leads to other effects which in fact minimize the signal. 
but they have spatially well separated samples. Okay. Now, <clears throat> one last thing which I think is really clever that um, I obviously why didn't I think but anyway, <clears throat> I've discussed stark tuning of these resonances. And but you can't always do this. For example, in this there's a whole series of resonances like this. For n greater than 43, you can start shifting into a into resonance. So this at zero is the 244d atoms, and slightly above it is <coughs> I guess 46p and uh, 40 no sorry 45p and 42 no, this is, this is yeah, sorry 46p and 42f at n part of and as you apply the field it shifts into resonance if you find and you can see the dipole dipole energy transfer resonances <coughs> this is all done in the mod. Uh, but in fact, at <coughs> ends less than 43, these levels are below, and when you turn on the electric field, they shift away, and when you know there's no resonance. These, these are resonances with higher, <coughs> higher star space states in the electric field. Okay, but you, you can't see these low field resonances anymore. And so, what they realized is that you can in fact shift things in any direction by just Check <coughs> picking the appropriate frequency of, of microwave field using the AC start shift, which, depending upon which side of resonance you're on, will either shift, thing, shift levels apart or bring them together. And <coughs> so, using a 28 gigahertz field, they in fact could bring this into resonance, and in fact, they see, could, could easily see these very low energy, <coughs> very low field resonances. This is the amplitude, the squared amplitude. Of this of the microwave field. And so it's a very small microwave field. And of course, these are where they calculate the resonance <coughs> positions. Uh, I, I should, <coughs> this of course brings me to my last point, which is <coughs> okay, when you have an initial state that's two Ds, a final state that's a P and F, you have just an incredible number of levels, right? <laughs> so, I mean, it's basically uh, just P two. Okay. So, and the strength of these <coughs> depends also on the orientation of the two atoms. I mean, if you have a field that's pointed this way, atoms here and atoms here interact differently. So if you actually want to use this to do something, uh, sort of like make a gate, it's basically hopeless. Okay. So <coughs> one of the first steps in this direction, or to remedy that problem that's been done in Tolman Fausen from Stuttgart, and they studied the same problem again. And, and they excited these at, they excited these D atoms by two photons from the ground state with two pulses. So they did a Ramsey experiment. And they had a magnetic field of 13 Gauss. And they also <coughs> selected in the excitation only the M sub J equal three half states. And, and then between these two optical pulses, they apply an electric field which of course shifts the D state, the 44 D state relative to the ground state, which introduces fringes into the, <coughs> into the optical Ramsey pattern. And so what they observed is shown here. This, this is in fact the Ramsey pattern taken at this field right here, and you can see the clear fringes. And as you raise the amplitude of this field pulse, you can see the, the, the <coughs> The excitation always stays here as you tune the laser, but you in fact see these, <coughs> these curvatures up like this that correspond to the second order Stark shift of the 44D state. And if you look at this really closely at several and, and make a plot of the contrast of these fringes, you can in fact see these very clear dips here that correspond to well-resolved Forster resonances. So by, in fact, applying a magnetic field, exciting one state as opposed to the other one in the world, they, in fact, had, in spite of this huge sea of levels, they, they can, in fact, extract information about isolated <coughs> uh, residents. So in, in summary, the, the, many of the aspects of, many of the qualitative aspects of dipole-dipole interactions in the, in the cold Rittberg gas you can see in collisions uh, but there are clearly are features that aren't, that don't exist in collisions, and in fact, I'm, I'm sure that there will be far more controlled experiments done in the future. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And I'd be happy to answer any questions.
questions now yes. or later. This is your chance. Yes. Yeah, so they, this um, uh, comes in me like yes. uh, the heavy shape. Yeah, so you're saying because the atoms aren't well behaved, what you see is a saturation. Right. So you would see a quantum, if, if I could in fact excite, if all the atoms I, I excited were this far apart and and if the field was this way, and they were here, not here, not here, but all here and the same distance apart, or here and the same distance, I could see the quantum beam. But, in, but, but as I move them closer together, the spacing between the, the dipole-dipole interaction increases, and so the spacing between those two eigenstates <coughs> increases, and the beat frequency increases. Yeah. So, it's, so it's, I mean, if you change the size of the dipole-dipole interaction, you change the beat frequency. You just lose the, you, know, you, you, kind of, you lose the, the signal. So, I mean, can you envision that? Is there a, a way to make your atoms well behaved so that you can see this, these beats, or is it? Yeah, well, it, yes, if, if you actually, if, if you had a blockade in the excitation, you ought to be, I mean, you could in principle see this, or if you start with them in a lattice, you should also be able to see this. Okay. Or if you only have two. Mark has a question. Tom, you mentioned these early experiments where you looked for energy transfer between the three <coughs> rotational levels. Did you ever actually observe that? Um, no, we, well, <coughs> one, well we, once we could see that we had this, we, we stopped. Uh, at Rice, they were busy going gangbusters doing this, but we, we were so confused originally as to what in the world we were seeing. We thought, well, the, the, well, uh, this is a cross-section, if we understand this, this is a cross-section of a billion different <coughs> I think we'll study this. So we never went back to do the HBR. We tried ammonia once, actually, but since I was doing the plumbing, I think when I opened the, the valve from the ammonia bottle, the room was full of ammonia, and that never stopped. <laughs> I was going to be a chemist when I was an undergraduate, but I decided I wouldn't remember. <laughs> Yes. Maybe you commented on that, and I missed it, but I just want to, you talked about the coherent oscillation where the, the excitation goes from one side to one end to another, and then to come back again. Is there any evidence so far that anyone has done where they see that return of the excitation, so some coherence in the oscillation? Um, yes. The, well, I, I whistled past the Stuckelberg oscillation, but that's what that is. Okay. Um, so, so okay, in in those ex yeah, I, I threw one. I threw some. So in those experiments in, in which you have, you know that the collision starts here and it ends here, and you can in fact put on a field that goes up like this. You you can in fact see, <coughs> you, you now you have effectively chosen an impact parameter, and so then you can see oscillations that correspond to. It's going back and forth. I'd really like to encourage questions from the students. Okay. So. Yes. You comment that this can be used as quantum gates. How how exactly? Do okay. That the, the resonant energy transfer isn't. I mean, if it's. I, 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 that's a good question. It, it's just simply the dipole-dipole interaction can be used as a as a quantum gate. Yeah. Oh, no. Sorry. No. <coughs> Okay. It's thank not you. really energy transfer. It's just, I guess it's just energy splitting. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any, any other questions, thoughts? Of course, Tom. Yeah, go ahead. What was the argument again for not seeing the uh, many body interactions in a beam? Um, oh, what? well, okay. <coughs> It's, well, first of all, if you compute, okay, to, to see binary collisions in a beam uh, required that we have a cross section of a, a billion square angstroms. To, at the pressures that we have, you, just, you don't have three atoms colliding at once. I mean, you need something like an atmospheric pressure to see that. Okay. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Oh, yes. Don't forget the so, um, so a lot of these experiments with atoms, laser beams, found atoms in the box. Yes. Um, so is there any concern with shining a laser beam and uh, 
pushing the atoms out of resonance when the photons incident on the atoms. Because I'm under the impression that the interaction between the laser beam and them the atoms are quite strong. Oh, okay, that, that's a good question. So, uh, actually that's not true. So, basically, in, in, these, in these experiments, the, the laser beam is quite weak. All it's doing is producing population. It, it's not strong. Okay. Okay. So there's no cause of concern for it? Well, okay. Maybe someday there will be, but at the moment there's no clear evidence for it. Okay, other questions? Are Any other questions? If not, let's thank Professor Gallagher.